Howdy, howdy, it's Tara, the Mud Creek Stitcher. I just did a floss tube, so you may have seen that pop up. And now I am doing a Bible study, back to back, trying to get stuff done. I didn't do a Bible study last weekend. I did the Jingle Ball, and I had a ball. So um, I am making up for lost time. Not really, I'm just going to do one Bible study. And then I'll just keep trying to go. We have three lessons left. So hip, hip, hooray. So if you're new here or you just happen to pop by, I'm Tara, and I'm the Mud Creek Stitcher, and I have been leading this Bible study. Hip, hip, hooray. It is written by Priscilla Shire. Um, she's done a lot of great Bible studies, and this is just another one. Just so much to learn. So anyways, um, yeah, this is my Bible study. Okay, I don't know what else I'm going to say. Well, I do know what I was going to say, but I don't think I'm going to say it yet. I'm gonna wait. Should I wait? I don't know. Maybe? Okay. When I'm done with this Bible study, I am gonna give my testimony. Um, I've given it before, but I'm gonna do it again because it's been a year. And yeah, I mean, I thought about it earlier. Should I? And the Lord is saying, yes, I should. So I will. Okay, well, let's do the Bible study first. So we are on page 199. It is week six, day three. Day three. So we just finished up with Elijah um, that he did that amazing running. He ran past Ahab and Jezebel and all that and or ran. Je yeah, Jezebel ended up dying, which, yeah. Yeah, I'm just kind of brushing up. It's been two weeks. So anyways, here we go. Day three, location services. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. 1 Kings 19.9 One of the most meaningful aspects of our redemption in Christ is that you and I can never reach a place so far away that we're beyond the reach of our Father's love, grace, and mercy. This gospel truth brings tears to my eyes when I contemplate the fact that he can reach me wherever I am, no matter how bleak or dry the wilderness I'm traveling through. David captured it well when he said, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, or Sheol, behold, you are there. If I say, Surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. Psalm 139, 7-8, through 8, and 11-12. through 12. So whether I choose a far road on my own, of my own volition, or whether I'm pressed into it by circumstances outside my control, either way, he is somehow able to make every road, even the most difficult road, lead back toward him. When I look back on the seasons of my life when I felt the most distant, I now see that even my best efforts at hiding were not effective in keeping me from him. He still came to find me, to reclaim me, to draw me back to himself. This is true for all of us, just like it was true for Elijah. So read the following verse and underline the spot where Elijah's journey led him after 40 days of traveling through the wilderness. So it's 1 Kings 19 eight through nine. And I'm just flipping my Bibles on there. So she put in here, he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, a mountain of God. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there. Now remember, she says with a little arrow, Mount Horeb. Horeb is the same as Mount Sinai, which is good to know. Circle where you find Mount Horeb on your map. Okay, so there's a map in the back of her Bible study. And it is... Doo, doo, doo. I don't know. Anybody see it? Oh, found it. It's at the bottom of the map of Israel. Okay. See, I circled it right there. Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. And I've been circling and marking as we've been going along. Okay. 
Okay. Elijah's depression had grown so severe that he willingly launched himself into the vast barren desert six long weeks away from his last known stop. The location where he ended up was far south of where the rest of his travels had taken place. He couldn't have known at this point if he'd ever see another human being again, or if he'd be able to survive the return trip, should he decide to head back. This season of solitude is distinct from Elijah's time at Kareth, the dwindling brook where God specifically sent him and promised to provide for him. Fear and despondency were the only guidelines leading him into this desert, dictating his direction and actions. Clearly, the tone of this portion of Elijah's story is a complete departure from the focused, purpose-filled journey thus far. And yet, God's redemptive purposes were still alive down here in the wilderness. This uncharted road will lead Elijah to an encounter with God that will reinvigorate, redirect, and refocus him. Here on this mountain and here in this cave, and she has a little mark here that says, the Hebrew text reveals that Elijah went to the cave, presumably a reference to the cave of Moses. He'll discover he can still hear God's voice and he can still participate in God's plan, despite the discouraged doubts that his effectiveness had come to a disparaging end. Yahweh can make sure that even a trip through the Sinai Desert will not have been in vain. I'm so glad this segment of Elijah's story is included in Scripture, aren't you? It reminds me that God is there, ready and waiting for us, even when circumstances have redirected us or we foolishly run into a wilderness of our own. In reality, this redemptive thread is what the Bible is all about, which is why evidences of it are scattered all over Scripture. Choose two of the following biblical personalities for a short case study. Read the passage for each and then answer the following questions. So we have Hagar, Jacob, Moses, Gideon, Peter, and Paul. Okay, I do like the story of Hagar. Okay, let's do Hagar. I'm just going to, I'm going to do one. You can do two. I'll just do one. Uh, Genesis 16, 1 through 13. Genesis 16, 16, 1 through 13. I do like Hagar. She's a good gal. Okay. Genesis 16, 1 through 13. Now, Sari, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sari said to Abram, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sari's proposal. So Sari, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happens ten years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. So Abram had sexual relations with Hagar. She became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress, Sari, with contempt. Then Sari said to Abram, This is all your fault. I put my servant into your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. Abram replied, Look, she's your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. Then Sari treated Hagar so harshly that she finally ran away. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness, along the road to Shur. The angel said to her, Hagar, sorry, servant, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, sorry, she replied. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress, submit to her authority. And then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And then the angel also said, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears. For the Lord has heard your cry of distress. This son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. So Hagar, I think I got her confused with somebody else. Rahab, whoops. But I still feel for Hagar. What a situation that she was put in. So she didn't really, I mean, she didn't have a choice to be like, no, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't want to, you know, be with your husband. Um, but anyways, sorry, I got off track here. Let's do the questions. 
How would you describe their emotional state? Which words or phrases lead you to this conclusion? Her emotional state. Well, I'm sure she was just like, what the heck? Why is my mistress making me do this? But she's a servant. She didn't have a choice. And then, of course, she's, she became pregnant and she started to treat her mistress sorry with contempt. So she obviously felt like, look at me, I'm better than you because you can't have kids. Then uh, what setting or circumstances were they enduring that might have made them feel hopeless, despairing, and distant from God? So Sari and Abram obviously felt distant, a little bit distant from God because he promised they'd have a son. And this son would have it have so many kids more numerous than the stars or as numer or as numerous as the stars. So I'm sure it's been years and years and years. They're really, really old by this time. And they're like, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So they try and take it into their own hands. How did they experience God and his character in a uniquely personal way? So for, for Hagar, um, you know, she ran away because she's being treated so bad. And even though her son, this is what I, I love, even though her son, Ishmael, was not to be the chosen one that God specifically chose, that was Isaac, God still promised Hagar that his that her son would have many, many kids as well. As many, many as well. It says, I'll give you more descendants than you can count. So I find that, you know, here he still took care of her. He still took care of her. I love that. Even though, you know, she still wasn't being a very nice person. God didn't care. He's like, I'm still going to take care of you. So, oh, I didn't do two people. How did the person's life change as a result of this encounter? Well, she went on to have Ishmael, and Ishmael was um, the one who pretty much had all the kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, and on and on, that fills the Middle East. And they are wild, wild people sometimes. They do fight a lot, don't they? Not always. Not always. But, I mean, come on. Look at the Middle East. There's a lot of fighting. And especially now. So, anyways... Of the two people you study, which one did you most relate to? Well, Hagar, um, I don't know if I related to her. I think a lot of us probably relate more to Sari or Sarah. Um, not able to have kids, impatient. You know, she's like 90 years old. She's been waiting. And there's this promise. And are we good at waiting on God's time? No. So I think we can all relate to Sarah, you know, I, we want everything right now. Why can't we just do everything right now? But that's not how it works with God. So pause and ask the Holy Spirit to personalize his word in your life right now. This is page 202. Ask him to open your spiritual eyes to see ways in which he is already present and how he is turning your current wilderness into a highway toward him. Below, record how you're sensing that he is redirecting you, changing you, revealing himself to you, and repositioning you for something new. Yeah. And I, I mean, I pray this a lot because um, I'm getting closer and closer to retirement. And it's like, you know, I'm. what do I do next? So I'm praying a lot about that, you know, and I, I want an answer now. Yeah. Um, but no answers yet. So stuff like that is definitely a great way to start out. You're like, what do you want me to do next? Or what do you want me to do at church on Sunday? Or what do you want me to do about that neighbor that I heard there's some problems? You know, he'll position you, move you where you need to be. Okay, 202. My 45th birthday was December 31st, 2019. Oh, she and I are about the same age. My mother died in my arms the day before. That was really sad. I remember that. She passed from cancer. I remember walking up on my birthday in a fog, not even remembering what date it was. To tell you the truth, the numb feeling continued for many months afterward. Unable to delay my own pending surgery, which I told you about, I was immediately thrust into a recovery process of another sort. My body's physical recovery, traveling directly alongside my soul's emotional recovery. It was tough. 
On many fronts, I noticed, for example, that I had a hard time digesting new information or being mentally productive or fully engaging in the most regular basic of life tasks, as well as staying focused on projects and endeavors that were once enjoyable activities. All the losses we'd endured in recent months had been difficult, but losing my own mommy, it seemed to push me over the emotional edge. Overnight, I felt as though I'd been thrust into a stagnant wilderness of exhaustion and numbness, and admittedly, like Elijah, I journeyed more deeply into it. That's why this section of Elijah's story, along with that of Hagar and Jacob and Moses and Gideon and Peter and Paul and a whole bunch of others, has really encouraged me. Their examples remind me that even when my paths are hurtful, disappointing, earth-shattering, or unexplainable, those same paths can still put me in prime position to experience God in a new way. To see Him from a new vantage point. To relate to Him and understand Him in a different, more mature, more dynamic way for the future. The Hound of Heaven can find us no matter where we are. Page 203. Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? Jeremiah 23, 23-24 Mount Horeb, or Mount Sinai, is in this desert of yours, sis. And even here we'll find God waiting for us. Nothing we're walking through has the power to take us away from him. Instead, inexplicably, we'll be drawn closer to him. All the pain or sadness or disappointment we may feel in these difficult places won't disappear. But the hope of his presence will break our fall. It puts the brakes on despair. His presence is like a bungee cord that yanks us back from the perilous death spiral of utter hopelessness. Never thought of it like that. Boing! Be encouraged and know that even this road, the one that goes off the map, is a road that can lead you back to him. I know it doesn't make, seem so, but because of his redemptive grace, you're actually headed in a direction brimming with the beauty and brilliance of a divine encounter. This road leads to the mountain of God, and he's already there ahead of you. So pray this. Father, I am dry and lonely. I am tired and out of answers. I don't see how I'll ever get beyond this and feel right again about anything. But even though I do feel lost and rudderless right now, I believe by faith that you haven't lost me. Thank you for being willing and able to make this wilderness my next step in a new direction. You will lead me through it and meet me on the other side. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So there you go. That's day three. That's interesting. I didn't realize he was in the same cave that Moses had been in. I think that's the cave that Moses asked to see God and God had to hide him in a crevice of a rock. Maybe not. I'll have to find that out later. So next time, day four, we will get going next weekend, hopefully. And then just one more lesson. And then you will have finished a Bible study. Me too. And that's great. Um, and that's something I wanted to know. Opinions. Do you want to do another Bible study with me? I would really appreciate comments, yes or no. If you're like, no, I'm good. Or yes, Tara, find another one and let's keep learning about the Lord. But if you're like, nah, okay. <laughs> I don't care. Um because I'm going to still study no matter what. Okay. So anyways, um, if that's all you want to stay for, thank you for watching. But I am going to go ahead and give my testimony, which I have not done that for a year. I feel like I gave my testimony my first floss to. I haven't, I really should go back and watch, but I don't remember. So anyways, let's do this. What's a testimony? I remember people saying those big words, testimony, and I'm like, what do you mean? Testify like in a court? Well, yeah, kind of. Uh, it's just telling when you realize that Jesus is real, when you realize that. So let me, let me back up my story. It all happened long ago when I was in my 20s. Wasn't that wonderful? Actually, I should back up further. It actually goes back to my own family, of course, and that's where it starts for all of us. Um, neither of my parents were believers. They were 
good parents considering um, all they had against them in a lot of ways. Then they had a lot of things going for them as well. But they were both only children. They didn't have brothers or sisters. And they got married. So I have no aunts and uncles. I have some great aunts and great uncles. Actually, I don't anymore. They've all passed now. But growing up, I didn't have cousins like most people do. I had second and third cousins, but not super close like so like my kids they have their first they have a lot of first cousins and they're close to a lot of them so i'm glad for that so anyways my parents were not believers my dad grew up in the methodist church my mom grew up in the catholic church both of them uh there were children of the 60s yeah so they both graduated in 64 so some of that instrumental time period was in the 60s and they both kind of thumbed their noses at the church and walked away. So anyways, uh, they get married and here comes my brother and I, my other little brother who came like eight years later. Yeah, he was a whoops surprise, um, but a good surprise. So anyways, uh, my mom for a while did take us to the Methodist church to Sunday school and we went like every Sunday, but once my grandma passed away, we didn't go anymore. So we didn't we didn't go to church regularly. We went on uh, Christmas and Easter. So we were the traditional priesters. That was us. I remember hearing that word for the first time. Kathy Tricoli, does anybody remember her? I heard her use that term before, and I'm like, oh yeah, that was my family. That's me. So anyways, um, my nanny, who's from England, I think I've mentioned her, I don't remember, Anyway, she was a war bride. She met my grandfather, World War II, in England. He was stationed there. They got married when she was 18, had my mom. She came over on a ship, and she lived with my grandpa in Nebraska. So, anyways, he uh, was not a nice man. He had an alcoholism. He was, he was an alcoholic. And I'm sure a lot of it had to do with being in World War II. I didn't, he was a carpenter. But I'm sure he probably heard stuff, saw stuff. And my own, um, my nanny would never talk about World War II, but my Aunt Pat, my great Aunt Pat, also moved over to Nebraska because she met a handsome boy as well. And that was a great marriage. Um, but my own Aunt Pat would talk about World War II. They were very poor. There was 12 brothers and sisters. They were very poor. And um, they couldn't always run to the shelter when the bombs were dropping where they were at and so a lot of times she said they just sit under the kitchen table and just hope the bomb didn't hit their house so that's the era that she grew up in my grandmother grew up in so anyways my grandmother was very much a strong catholic woman she uh, almost became a nun um, but met that american soldier and had my mom instead so anyways she was probably the first driving force in my life as far as believing in God. So she worked for a priest. She was a housekeeper for a priest. His name was Father Gergen. And um, we would spend our summers at the rectory running around and um, playing in the holy water and being naughty little brats like that. And she would make us go to church. And she would make us go to vacation Bible school and stuff like that where my mom wouldn't. And that's, I still remember one specific vacation Bible school is where I learned the Lord's Prayer. So anyways, um, time passes, I'm growing up, really don't ever go to church. Just went a little bit for my confirmation because the Methodists, they don't do like testimony and a baptism in a tank. They do, you take some confirmation classes about your baptism, what it is, and then sprinkle a little water on you and call it good. And I didn't pay attention. I was 14. I did not care. We just giggled and laughed and screwed around the whole time. So anyways, so I got confirmed, didn't believe anything. I thought I was a, I thought I was a Christian, whatever that meant. So anyways, time passes. I go to college and that's where I really get messed up. Nevertheless, I mean, I understand. I didn't have a good foundation. My parents really dropped the ball. And my nanny, she passed away when I was 15. And um, she, I th she was trying to lay that foundation. And there were some seeds there, obviously. But she'd passed away before, I think, um, 
she could have done more. So anyways, uh, college, I take a class and the way this guy talked in this class, I was convinced, you know, the world is millions and bazillion years old. God's not real. Um, we're all going to be dirt and we're just going to disappear someday. Boom. Right. So that was that college class. So in the meantime, I might meet this cute little farm kid and we end up getting married and we move back to our little town and uh, his family is their believers. They go to church. They are Christian. So I didn't understand really what Christianity was. I just thought it was a lifestyle. I think that's what I thought. It's a lifestyle. You, you will look a certain way and have a certain reputation when you go to a church. So I wanted that reputation. So we um, went to church. Started When my kids were born, I started taking them to church all the time. Um, well, my son, oh, he was a wild one. Uh, so off and on, I'd get him to church. It just depend on how he was doing that Sunday. But eventually, by age three, every Sunday we were getting to church. We did all the Sunday schools, vacation Bible schools, all that stuff. So anyways, I thought I was living the right lifestyle. <sighs> So anyways, um, it was about when my baby boy, so I had my daughter, my precious little girl, and then my baby boy was born. It was when he was about one year, yes, he was about one year old, and my mother called, it was 7.30 in the morning, I remember that, and it was the day of my husband's grandmother's funeral, his beloved grandmother, and my mom called 7.30. I assumed she was calling to ask me about the funeral. But first thing she said was, I suppose you've heard. And I'm like, heard what? You know, because I was feeding my son a bottle and I was out of it and tired and we had a lot to get ready for the funeral. And she goes, well, your dad left. I'm like, what do you mean he left? Well, your dad left. When I got home from work, because she used to work at a call center in um, a little city. When I got home from work, everything was dark, clothes were gone, power shut off, phone shut off. I'm like, what? She said he left. He he left a note and he said he was going to call and tell you that he was leaving me. And boy, it just spiraled from there. So I made it to the funeral that morning. And thank I'm so glad it was a funeral. I mean... Nothing against my husband's grandmother. She was wonderful. And of course, I know she's in heaven. She was a strong Christian woman. But I was so glad it was a funeral because I was starting to really cry. And it wasn't because of Grandma Velma. It was because that my dad had disappeared and left my mom. So anyways, I was completely brokenhearted. Some family members came over. I felt so bad drawing away from the funeral and the importance of that, but they still supported me during that time. So anyways, come to find out, um, my dad ended up having an affair, a secret affair, and didn't tell anybody except his two best friends. And he had actually lied to his two best friends and claimed that my mom was a gambler, which, okay, she did love to gamble. But he claimed that the mafia was trying to kill him and all this stuff, and she owed hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, I mean, just the craziest, nuttiest lies. I'm just like, I didn't even know my dad knew how to lie. So my whole world and picture of my dad was shattered completely. None of that was true. Um, but what my dad did do was clear out all the bank accounts and stole all the money that was, uh, personally mom's. That's what he did. And he did it all for this woman he had met and he met her somewhere. I don't even know where, somewhere far away. I don't know. So anyways, all that happened and I mean, it just broke us. It broke all of us, even though I was an adult my older brother's an adult. My other brother technically was an adult, but he was like 19, so he's really not an adult. It broke us all, and we couldn't understand it. And so when you are broken, like we were, 
and many of you, you know what I'm talking about, you start to really search and think and you're just like, what's the point of living or what's the meaning of all of this and how could he do that and and who is my true father and so anyways while all this is going on and a lot of people try to be supportive but I was just so angry I just kind of lashed out at anyone who mentioned it I was like, <coughs> yeah that was me so anyways God had planted me specifically in a school system where I was surrounded by strong Christian women, teachers. When I say strong, I mean strong, God-fearing Christian women who all of them, yes, all of them had grown up strong in their churches, strong in their faith. Their parents laid the wonderful foundation and just, just amazing. So anyways, delicately, I don't even know how they did it, but I'm sure God guided them. God worked through them and they would share things about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and I don't know. It just slowly, slowly began to absorb into my heart the things they were saying. I mean, it took a while, it took a few years. And it really wasn't until, I'll never forget this, we were standing at recess because the kindergarten teacher, first grade teacher, and I, we always like to stand together at recess and chat. So always trying to make sure our recesses were all together. And we were chatting, and one of them mentioned about, boy, when I go to heaven, I can't wait till I get my new body. And my, <laughs> I was like, hmm? You know, what? I never heard this before. What? New body? And so they were like, yeah, you get a new body when you go to heaven. Yeah, you didn't know this? I'm like, no, I don't know this. I don't know anything. So that's kind of where I really started to investigate. Like, what is, what is this Jesus thing? What, do I get a new body? So anyways, I didn't open a Bible, of course. I was still just trying to figure stuff out. And I ended up getting a book from a gift from my sister-in-law called Heaven. And I know I've shown this, shown the book on Floss too, um, Heaven by Randy Alcorn. And when I read, gosh, and I think I found it and showed it on my Floss too, but I can't remember. Um, there's a section when he says heaven is real and hell is real. It just scared me, scared me. And um, that's when I started to panic. And you know, like, I, I don't want to go to hell. And I, it wasn't too long ago I heard press, uh, Pastor Brett from Athey Creek. He talked about this, you know, why do we all want to go to heaven? Because we're scared. We don't want to go to hell. Yeah. Okay. Scared. So anyways, that's when I finally started to open up the Bible and started to read. And then I went to something with those same teachers called Women of Faith. And it was in Denver that year. And there was about... A group of 15, 12 to 15 of us who went, and it was sealed from that point on. I um, accepted Christ. Um, I just still remember the change in my heart. I remember just everything was bright and light. You don't realize you're in darkness until true repentance happens. And I had true repentance, praise the Lord. And I know I didn't do this, okay, guys? I didn't do this, none of this. This was all God. Every time we try and think like, well, I open the Bible, I'm reading the word. No, 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 no. It's God. And it was God calling to you. And that was God calling to me like, hey, I am your dad. I am your father. And I've always been here and you're not paying attention to me. You need to pay attention to me because I will take care of you as I always have. So that's when I really started to explore the Bible, started doing Bible studies. Um, still wasn't reading the Bible regularly, but a little bit better, a little bit better. And once I changed, it was for the best for our family. We all changed and um, it's all through God. For sure. It's glory to God. Um, and through my salvation, I know God saved my mom. 
because she wasn't a believer. But, and you know, I and I share this story at the end of her life, a couple days before she passed away this summer, she told me about, she was talking to dad and I kept going, okay, wait, your dad, you don't like your dad because he was a nice man. And then I'm like, wait, my dad, you guys got divorced. You don't like each other. Um, and then when she said, no, I was ta I'm t been talking to our dad. Um, that was a wonderful assurance. Um, so I know all through God's work in my heart, he's done so much for so many people. And it's fun to watch him work in everyone else around you. And then you feed off of that, your heart does, and your spirit's just like, ooh, I want to do that. I don't know. So anyways, that is my testimony. I'm sticking to it. Um, I don't know. Gosh, I've talked a lot. I feel like I've taught all day, but I haven't. And I didn't have to reprimand you and tell you not to lick your scissors. So that was nice, because that's what I had to do the other day. I had a couple of them try. I don't know. Second graders. So anyways, that's my testimony. Um, and working on growing in my faith every day. It's not perfect, but God is, thank goodness. And he's still working on me and he'll be working on me until I see him face to face. So anyways, next Bible study, hopefully next weekend. Have a wonderful week and I'll see you again. Thank you and may the good Lord bless you.